Hi everyone, no full intro today. I just want to go ahead and get right into it because we are going to be responding to comments from two of my recent videos on incels and the manosphere discovering kink. I feel like I might be losing my mind by deciding to do this, but I promise I have my reasons, okay? On the one hand, there are a few things I want to clarify just for my own peace of mind, and on the other, I don't want to give the impression that I am completely unwilling to talk about certain issues or that I don't care about them. I also don't think this is something I've really seen other content creators do before, at least not in the format I'm about to do it in, and I feel like that's important. I honestly didn't expect either of the two videos I made to reach so far outside my usual audience, but they very quickly did, like literally within minutes of me publishing those videos. I'm not sure what I thought the comments would be like, but they ended up being quite different than the sort of comments I assumed I would get in the abstract. And sure, more than a few people did leave slur-filled, hateful messages, but these days, the worst of the worst does usually get scooped up by YouTube's automated comment filter. So, what I want to do is take a look at some of the common responses I received, and I will share my thoughts about them and maybe clarify some things along the way. So, Firstly, there is one that I want to nip right in the bud because it's about my channel and the kind of content I make and me being a hypocrite. These comments were usually something like, YouTube is basically broad day and public might need to reflect on that statement, or you shouldn't be talking about this, or Andrew Tate, or whoever, supposedly giving dangerous examples to minors because look at what you do. And early on in the video, I talked about how young folk are openly discussing things they learned from Andrew Tate or his acolytes out in public. They have no shame about this and see no reason why those thoughts might be unacceptable to the general public and I thought this was concerning. Now, for my own channel, I don't think I really talk about subject matter that's in any way comparable to what Tate talks about, but on the off chance that this video or the previous ones get picked up by a more mainstream creator, I do want to make something clear. I've been making content on YouTube for about like eight or nine years now, and I am very familiar with my analytics and the people who see my videos. YouTube estimates that about 0.5%, that is half of a single percent of my views, come from accounts under the age of 18. The largest demographic of people who watch my videos are actually over 25, if you can believe it. I start every live stream by telling minors not to engage with me. I literally have a giant 18 plus only thing that I use, and I have many videos over the years where I tell minors not to try kink, and I don't make content that I believe would be intriguing to young people. This is part of the reason why I don't use TikToks, and I've never tried to make a YouTube short before. Of course, people can always fake their age on their Google account, because who didn't do this online as a young person, but the point is I don't cultivate a child audience. I don't want minors to watch me. I discourage them. I've even had people tell me that they specifically waited to try BDSM until they were older because they randomly found one of my streams or videos and heard me talk about why it's a bad idea to engage with stuff like this when you're younger. Can the same be said for folks like Tate or Sneeko? If my videos did seem to attract minors for whatever reason, I would change how I make them in a heartbeat. But in eight years, it's never really been a problem. The algorithm knows my content is made for adults and watched by adults, so I have it tagged in the back end. So the only way people who aren't adults could find my videos is by looking for very specific search terms. And even then, they're just as likely to see a video from just pearly things debating why women need to be submissive to their husbands as they are to see me. And that's doubly the case because many of my videos are age-restricted and the remainder are almost all of the time demonetized, making them even harder to find through mere suggestion. 
I think maybe we should be more concerned about kids having unlimited, unsupervised screen time if you're worried about children seeing content like mine. Unfortunately, with the demise of specialized forums and social media's dominance of the internet, it's impossible to fully conceal ourselves from the eyes of people who probably shouldn't be looking at stuff like this yet. It could be YouTube, Twitter, or anywhere. So I choose to balance the need for accessible education education for adults against the need for discretion. And so far, I've been able to keep things balanced enough to where it doesn't really seem to cause any problems. I realize that for some people, there's literally no way for me to win this argument, though. Discussing adult relationships and intimacy publicly on the internet is just never okay for some folks. And if that's you, I can't make you believe me, but hopefully you can see that I'm being thoughtful about this. I'm not trying to expose kids to it. I don't want them to engage with me, okay? But moving on, I want to get into responses that more had to do with the nature of the videos themselves, not really who I am as a content creator personally. So probably tied for first place in terms of the sheer number of times I saw a comment about this is the allegation that I don't care about men, or you think men are always the problem and you blame men for everything. What about when women do bad things? What about misandry? And I want to say that upon reflection, I did not do as good of a job of making this clear as I could have. Like I talked about earlier, I didn't think this video would instantly reach outside my audience the way that it did. I guess there's a pretty sizable amount of people who will instantly be recommended a video with Manosphere in the title, regardless of if they've ever watched anything from that channel before or not. So I was operating off of the belief that this is my audience and they know who I am and what my values are, so of course I don't have to bend over backwards to make it clear that I'm not a misinterest. I do care quite a lot about men's issues. I have talked about things that disproportionately impact men in the BDSM community many times. I've talked about men who struggle with reconciling their kink identity with masculinity. I've also covered topics that aren't just for men, but are often inspired by the problems I've seen men in my life go through. Issues with guilt and shame, coping with the experience of being taken advantage of for your skills, the struggle to find a suitable kink partner, partner on dating apps and how to deal with it when you have a partner who is non-consensually topping from the bottom, for example. I've also been an advocate against gendered pricing structures at BDSM events, and I try as much as possible in all of my videos to use neutral pronouns when referencing the various kink roles one can use. I haven't shied away from the fact that men and people of all genders can experience DV, coercion, and boundary violations. Those are all very real problems. I meant what I said in those two videos. I feel very real empathy for the struggles of incels and other men who are longing for security in their relationships, who want to find someone to have a life with. I know how often the worldviews, like being an incel, like being in the red pill, are born out of pain and rejection and not having other answers. Those wounds are real. I don't personally think that the bulk of Manosphere ideology is good for men or good for anyone, really. So while I struggle to have sympathy for those who cynically make a fortune selling overpriced internet courses to desperate men, I do have sympathy for the audience of in my opinion, such grifters. One specific variant of this comment I saw a few times was about pro-doms and misinterests inside the BDSM community. Why don't I call those things out as being a rampant problem? Why am I only focusing on the manosphere? And again, this comment relies on being at least somewhat ignorant of the full history of my channel. I've made a lot of videos over the years, and I mean a lot, okay? I have actually talked a few times before about how to avoid scammers and other problems like dealing with bots on dating apps and unethical poser pro-doms. Misinjury specifically, though, is an interesting one because I know I have talked about this in videos at least a time or two before. Now, I can't recall the specific videos I did this in, but if I do remember, I will have them linked down below. 
Usually this has come up when I've discussed a general distaste for basing one's kink on strict gender essentialism. There are pro-doms and doms alike who will at least play act at believing in female supremacy. I've yet to meet any who seriously believe this in real life, but they do exist online and they're pretty convincing. They mostly do it, I find, as a marketing tactic too, you guessed it, attract male clients who are into women who think they are superior to men. I don't really see it as a common widespread problem, and I've never heard it come up as a genuine belief in conversation. But that being said, I will just make it crystal clear that I think that basing any worldview on one gender or sex being superior above all others is asinine and reductive, and I don't want to have anything to do with it, okay? Does that clear things up? I hope so, because I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next point. For this one, I want to go ahead and revisit and clarify some scientific understanding. A surprising number of people took issue with the section on fertility rates and the ability to get pregnant as you get older. It obviously wasn't the main focus of the video, so I didn't evidence it maybe as strongly as I would have otherwise, but I got quite a number of comments from folks along the lines of, oh, gee, you can't trust anything she says. She doesn't think that fertility goes down as you get older. Do you really think it's as easy to get pregnant at 35 as 25? What a dummy. They call it a geriatric pregnancy for a reason. And no, 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 okay, that's not what I'm saying at all, so let's talk about this. For as long as I can remember, people have been saying that your fertility falls off a cliff, and I quote, at 35, and you need to start listening to your ticking biological time bomb before the clock runs out. This makes women panic and feel pressure to start families before they are emotionally, mentally, or financially prepared to do so. And often this can also mean settling with someone who maybe wouldn't be the best parent because you think they're the best you're ever going to get before the hourglass runs out. This is a pressure that many manosphere and far-right figures stoke by talking about how many eggs Taylor Swift has left and how women are happiest when they start large families as young as possible. Often this is bundled with beliefs about youth and beauty. You know, the whole, of course she's the most attractive at 15, that's when she has the highest number of eggs left kind of thing, which I personally find, and I hope most of you find, quite disgusting. This idea of a cliff is something I believed in for a long time. Everyone repeated it, so I assumed that it was just true. And then one day, I was researching fertility for a video I'd been working on about the trad wife movement. Spoiler alert, I'm working on a video about that. And I discovered the data set that gets used to make these claims. Do you know what that data set is? It's church birth records from 18th century France. Of course, the average fertility rate was going down dramatically by a woman's 30s. Many of them had probably gone through a dozen pregnancies and who knows how many live births by that point. They could have had 10 kids by then and been so done with it. And after that many births and miscarriages, it wouldn't be uncommon to also have some kind of birth-related injury that would make carrying a pregnancy pregnancy to term once again more difficult. It's apples and oranges to compare women in 18th century France who might not have been trying to have more kids at that age and in fact may have been trying to avoid additional pregnancies for the sake of their health to modern women actively trying to conceive on purpose. Luckily, this is not the only data set we have to go from these days. I showed some of the more recent data on screen in that previous video, but let's talk about it some more. According to research from 2004, quote, for women aged 27 to 34, the study showed that 86% will have conceived within a year of trying. It also found that 82% of women aged between 35 and 39 fell pregnant within a year. That's only a 4% difference, which doesn't sound like much of a cliff to me. 
This is not to say that menopause isn't real or that people shouldn't think carefully about family planning, just that the cliff everyone bandies on about is much more like a gentle hill. I'm not making comments about genetic abnormalities or things like that because the science there is complicated, though it doesn't seem to be as huge of a problem as some would believe. Not to mention, it's something that the age of the father also contributes to, though you'd scarcely ever see that discussed alongside the whole women are genetically wired to find older men attractive thing. And by the way, it's not like women having children at an older age is a new modern crisis. Almost 90 years ago, in 1938, the average age of a woman's first birth was almost the same as it is now, 29. By the way, the term geriatric pregnancy is something we made up. It's not a truth by itself. It's also a term that most modern medical practices are moving away from using in favor of advanced maternal age. The term existing is not proof that the cliff is real. I'm not sure how this is supposed to rebut my point since I wasn't talking about other things around pregnancy like abnormalities or health issues or getting pregnant when you're 45, for example. I was just saying that it's possible to get pregnant often much more easily than one might expect, even in your 30s specifically. If this simple statement is still confusing to you, I don't really know what to say. I'm, I don't, that's, that's going to be on you, boo. So, okay, I, I, I've buried the lead a bit here. Earlier, I said that there were two types of comments that were tied for most common response under these videos, and I addressed one of them already, and now I'm going to talk about the second. This flavor of comment goes something like, you used bias sources for your definitions, and the red pill and incels and PUAs are not all the same, and often they also included the statement that the red pill is good for men actually, and it's not bad, and you're misunderstanding what it's for. So let's explore this one for a bit. The term manosphere, though not invented by journalists, was largely popularized by them, so I understand why those within the groups referred to collectively as the manosphere might not be comfy with that term. Although, other important thought leaders within the manosphere are happy to use that term for themselves. I've yet to hear any evidence, though, for why it's not a good catch-all, considering that they still share most of the same core beliefs, that feminism is ruining society and or women, that misandry is a huge problem on par with misogyny, if they even think that misogyny is a real problem, and that also there is a crisis of masculinity, either personal or cultural, that needs to be addressed. But Maybe I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. I don't think that all of these groups are the same or that they have the exact same beliefs. Obviously not. They have separate groups for a reason. PUAs and incels often don't get along and on average disagree about what matters for attracting a woman, but they do overlap. They often share terminology, acronyms, and even influencers. Some go as far as to say that the idea of the red pill is the concept that binds them together. Rolla Tomasi says about the collection of ideologies under the Manosphere umbrella, quote, their subjective prescriptions either follow in the wake of red pill praxeology or they find their preconceptions validated in some part by the data and awareness that the red pill brings to them. Most sources I've read, yes, even Manosphere sources, seem to support the idea of the red pill being a thing. So what is the red pill, and is it actually good for people? Let's look at a couple of different definitions and uses of the phrase red pill. Going back to Rollo Tomasi for a second, he says, When I talk about the red pill, I'm talking about intersexual dynamics and cutting yourself away from all of that. Next, according to r slash the red pill, the Red Pill, discussion of sexual strategy in a culture increasingly lacking a positive identity for men. They define the Red Pill as, quote, 
the recognition and awareness of the way that feminism, feminists, and their white knight enablers affect society, an awareness of the dark truths surrounding human sexuality, hypergamy, women's AF slash BB strategies, society's feminine imperative, sexual differences in emotional attachment, women's attraction to DT that is dark triad traits, and sexual dominance slash violence. Next, we have something from the Roosh V forums where users say that, quote, most people on this forum will use the term red pill to describe the discovery of women's true sexual nature. And finally, the incel wiki describes it as, quote, the red pill is typically defined as recognizing that most males are seen as disposable, modern society is inherently gynocentric, that women are hypergamous maters who are also generally high deceptive towards men, particularly as it comes to what male traits they are innately attracted to, and the endorsement of masculinism. All of these definitions and uses of the red pill are taken from the words of those in the manosphere directly, and while they aren't identical, they certainly have some overlap, especially in one key area, that women have a hidden, darker sexual nature that the dominant blue pill society doesn't want you to know about or acknowledge. The imperative of the red pill is to understand this nature and take back your power as a man. On one layer of the red pill, understanding this nature means believing in things like women's epergamy and believing that you need to engage in looks maxing game and or improving your finances or getting better at grooming or increasing your social standing to succeed in the sexual marketplace. This is where the Jordan Peterson level advice comes in normally. You know, stand up straight, pick up your room, act confident. You don't need the red pill to get this advice, though. There are plenty of authors like John Gottman and Terry Reel who have written great books addressed to men and couples on how to build happier relationships. But this is the nature of the onion that is the red pill. The red pill is multi-layered. For some, the red pill stops with this more mundane go-to-the-gym-to-be-more-attractive type of help. But it can easily and quickly go deeper. And that starts with the obvious implications of the red pill. What sort of sexual strategy would men be encouraged to take part in if they're led to believe that all women are fundamentally deceitful, irrational, securely attracted to violence and psychopathy, among many other claims? Some may use the lighter versions of Dread Game that I discussed in my video about the Manosphere, but when that doesn't work, there's always another deeper layer of the onion, one that is more pernicious, one that is more aggressive. The deeper you go, the less and less empathy towards women you'll be expected to have. Relational terrorism is just a tool in your toolkit to get your due as a man. Women aren't really other people. They are enemy combatants in sexual warfare. Everything goes. That's what's fair. But the people on the top level of the onion deny these other deeper layers, either because they don't know these layers exist, or they don't want to know, or they want to minimize them as being an outer fringe group that doesn't really represent the true red pill. But the people who've traveled to the center of the onion are laughing at the fools a few levels up. Oh, those poor sods haven't figured it out yet. One day they'll see but it is nice having them run cover for us. The reality is that all of these levels are part of the red pill. The influencers who tell men to wake up early and take an ice bath are in the same cultural group as the men who think marital R-word isn't real and that 15-year-olds should be betrothed to older men who match them on some numerical ranking scheme. Sometimes they're the same guy on different platforms. If what you want is advice for finding dates or having better relationships or developing confidence, you don't actually need to believe in all of the other crap that goes along with red pill ideology. There are other options, other books, other influencers. So if you are choosing to stay in the red pill, ignoring its fundamental path to violence I just laid out, 
it must be because on some level you agree with or like hearing the things that go a little deeper than just innocuous self-help guru BS. So, for the majority of this video, I've been talking in generalities about the replies I've received. But for our final act, I want to quote directly from a specific comment that encapsulates a particular sentiment I saw perfectly. Quote, if you listen to Evie's video, she is clearly speaking out of ignorance about men's groups that are probably 99% nonviolent against women and would never advocate for such a thing and saying they should be identified, exposed, and kicked out of all kink and BDSM groups and that people should tell her about it so she can help get rid of them and saying that kink and BDSM doesn't belong to them is wrong and borderline evil. That is not the tolerance and acceptance the group was known for in the past. A.K.A. so much for the tolerant left kink edition. I found through comments like this one that I had an, unbeknownst to me, a sizable chunk of my audience who align themselves with the red pill or other manosphere-related ideology. They were offended that I didn't think people who support manipulation tactics like Dread Game should be in our community. They disliked that I took a strong stance against outsiders infiltrating our community for the sake of laundering their ideology. And just to refresh everyone's memory, what did I actually say at the end of that video? Roll the tape. This is why we have to be vigilant. This is why we have to be careful about letting pickup artists and red pillars and manosphere people into our spaces because they are adopting our language, they are getting very confused about DS and BDSM, they are passing on that confused knowledge to their very young fan bases, and I can only see this problem getting worse over time. I, I don't think this is going to go away anytime soon. I just think we have to be very aware. You know, Fat Life has had problems with people like this in the past, and if you see somebody spouting this ideology, and they say they're kinky and to not kink shame them, Sorry, sometimes you do got a kink shame. You're not welcome here. Don't, don't, you're not in my club. Leave. You're not allowed here. Get out. You're very, ugh. Just, I want kink to be a place that is accepting and welcoming, and I do not want people like this to get a foothold. So be aware of how language is changing. If you guys have seen it, tell me about it. I want to know. Post about it. Call it out. So I'm going to make a comparison that some people aren't going to like, but I believe it demonstrates my point well. Have you heard the old adage about how regular bars turn into Nazi bars? It goes something like this. A guy shows up at a punk bar. He's wearing the typical uniform of a punk, but with some questionable iconography on his vest and backpack. But he's polite enough, nice even, maybe tips well. So the bartender says nothing. And the next time, he brings a friend. And the time after that, they bring even more friends good business, right? They start speaking more overtly about their beliefs, wear more obviously fashy symbols. It makes the other patrons, especially the ones who are part of minority groups, uncomfortable. Folks who are regular stop coming. More new folks, who are now unmistakably Nazis, start coming. Eventually, the bar is full of them. Now they're openly discussing their beliefs, maybe making plans to intimidate folks at pride rallies or other events. But if you say something now, it's too late. They outnumber you, and they have no reservations about making things a problem. Universal tolerance isn't actually one of my values, nor is it one for the BDSM community. Events regularly keep massive lists of people who aren't allowed in or should be watched closely if they do attend. Sometimes it's people who have previously violated other folks' consent. Sometimes it's people who liked wearing racist iconography on their shirts at parties. Many places have barriers to entry, like requiring you to take an orientation class before you can go to a party, or maybe you have to attend a few munches first and then be vetted before you can even find out that there's a venue to play at in your area. And I doubt that many of us would want to remove these barriers and swing the doors wide open for any random Joe Schmo in khakis to walk through. It's not evil to suggest that we need to maintain boundaries to preserve our accepting and loving community. 
It's actually the very foundation of that love. To borrow an off-sided quote from philosopher Karl Popper, quote, if we extend unlimited tolerance even to those who are intolerant, if we are not prepared to defend a tolerant society against the onslaught of the intolerant, then the tolerant will be destroyed, and tolerance with them. And what is misogyny if not extreme intolerance for women? If misogyny underpins manosphere beliefs, then, well, I know where I stand. And you know what? Nothing is stopping you from making your own community. You don't have to use our spaces. You can start your own red pill friendly munches. You can build your own dungeons if you want to. Go ahead, be my guest. But I wonder if there's a reason why the average cynical red pill thought leader would rather take over an existing space with existing people instead of making their own. In this way, they become a right-wing figure by both radicalizing and being radicalized by their audience. Infiltration is deliberate. The far right will reliably target any community that has, one, a large white male population, two, whose niche interests allow them to feel vaguely marginalized, and three, who are not used to progressive critique of said interest. Yeah, wonder what's going on there. So, I'm sorry to disappoint all of you, but this is the only time I'm going to be talking about all of this. I think I have now said my piece and I have made my arguments. No, I will not be going on any podcast to debate anyone. I am not interested in theater. But there is one last thing I wanted to draw attention to. Maybe you've already noticed it if you watched those other videos. But do you remember what the crux of my Manosphere video was, why I made it? I forgive you for not remembering since this video ignored that topic almost entirely unless I brought it up. It was a story about a guy in a relationship who took the advice that he'd gotten from red pill discussion forums and used it to mentally manipulate his girlfriend. She began suffering from acute depression and got pretty dang close to having a full-on mental breakdown. I did not get a single comment defending this. The best I'd get is, well, yeah, that's, that's, that's black pill stuff. The red pill or the manosphere or whatever is totally fine, though, and other no-true-Scotsman-esque fallacies. It's like they willfully skipped over the part of the post where he talks about the red pill and uses their terminology. Is the statement, I do have very desirable long-term traits that cement my value, something a hopeless black-pilled guy says? Not really, not usually at least. But engaging with that is a non-starter. Taking in the idea, that red pill ideology, even just sometimes with some people, can lead to abuse and destruction is impossible for many. They can't play defense. They can't justify that. So the safe thing is to always be on the attack. Always make the other party do the explaining and look for any tiny reason to discount what they say. And it's easy because I'm a woman. That's why instead of listening to the story I told and how messed up it was and that it was messed up because of the skills that person learned from the red pill, folks instead derailed into talking about fertility rates, whether I have the right definition of red pill from unbiased sources, accusing me of not doing enough to call out misandry in my videos, or saying I don't care about men without knowing the first thing about me. Any tiny quibble gives the person a reason to stop listening. Oh, thank God, thank goodness, she doesn't use the exact definition of red pill that I was taught. Therefore, everything she says is probably wrong, and she has to explain herself to death first before I'll even consider listening to the next two minutes of what she has to say rationally. This was the response that took me by surprise when I made this video. I wasn't expecting just how many people would loudly and proudly stop listening over the most mundane issues like disagreeing on the definition of a word that, by all accounts, doesn't actually have a set definition. But it's not my job to convince people like that that I'm right.
I think it would probably be impossible. I just don't share their worldview, and I'd basically have to agree to it in order to try to start to convince them. What I wanted to do was talk to my own community and raise awareness about something that I see that I think is potentially dangerous and concerning. I'm not going to be the straw man that you AWOLed at to convince yourself that you're winning, because I know how this game works. So, sorry, I'm not playing it anymore. I hope for the people that are in my audience who wanted to know more, who genuinely wanted to get some additional information, got that out of this video. I'm not sure if I'm going to be making more videos like this in the near future, to be completely frank. It's exhausting just on a time basis. Like, to do research for this and do videos twice a week is really difficult. This was a super long script, and I mean, this just shows the power of having a teleprompter because normally a video like this would take me, like, probably two hours to film, and I just did it in the cool 40 minutes, so good job me. <laughs> Things are improving. So yeah, I guess let me know what you all think about this. If you want to see more content like this, I have a couple of ideas brewing in the back of my head in the works, but I don't necessarily want to get started with them right now. Maybe want to take a little bit of a breather, do some more traditional regular content, maybe not write, you know, 5,000 whatever. It was, it was like eight pages. It was very, it was a very long script. So I'm going to maybe not do this for a minute. So let me know what you think about that. Let me know all your other thoughts in a comment down below. Uh, and thanks for watching. I guess thanks for hearing me out if you made it all the way to the end. And if you like videos like this, if you want to see more educational content about kink and BDSM, you can subscribe because I do at least try to make videos twice a week. If you do really want to support what I do, the best way you can do that is with Patreon. Link to that will be down below. If you do already support me there, thank you so, so much. It means the absolute world to me. And until I see you all next time, I hope you have a great yesterday and a great rest of your week. Bye-bye.